So I'm going to talk about genetics. Now, um, fear not, this is not going to be a hard talk. There's no test afterwards. Um, but I want you to think about CSI. You know, it looks really easy and it's really useful. Now, given that they do it in about a tenth of the time that we do, um, that's one of the impediments of genetics is it can take a little bit longer than we expect it to. But it's not um, insurmountable and it is actually a really useful tool. So for an ecologist, you might go out and count things. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm just counting gene surrogates or representations of gene surrogates. It's just a counting exercise and then we just do some analytics on the, the counts and we produce genetic data that's informative. And so for restoration, in the standards, we're trying to assist the recovery of ecosystems. We're not taking them through all that way. So we're starting down this end and we're putting it through a process and then we're hoping that we're going to get this at the other end, including all of these bits as well. Now, I think I've heard two major changes in the way we're talking about restoration at this conference. One is that we've got standards to work with, not to, but with, which I think is really important. The other thing is everyone's starting to talk long term, you know. We had a really good point about short term is not good enough, but everyone is now thinking about what I do now is the legacy for future generations. And I think that's a really big shift in our thinking and it's a really important shift. Um, so we should eventually, hopefully, get this, but it's not going to be for us to see. So some seedy assumptions. Seed's plentiful. Well, we all know that's not true. It's erratic and it's driven primarily by the environment. It's pretty much unavailable for all the groups that you would like to put in, you know? When you think about it, all the stuff, all the little tiny things you'd like in the ground layer, almost impossible to get, and then almost impossible to germinate, and then almost impossible to get to survive. Um, so, create some species substitutions that may or may not be appropriate. It's also creating very low species diversity in our restoration efforts lack of resilience, because we don't build redundancy into the system. We build redundancy in maybe for acacias and eucalypts, the rest of it we have no resilience. The second assumption is that it's all of equal high quality. If I collected from this population, that population, across years, across sites, it's all going to be of equal quality. It will all germinate in the same way and survive in the same way, and we all probably know that's not true as well. The other assumption leading on from that is that it's all genetically diverse. Uh, but we have some issues with inbreeding in fragmented systems. Um, that has an impact on how our populations are going to travel into the future in terms of how well they persist. And if we're planting low genetic diversity populations, we're actually setting them up to fail because they can't cope with change. So I'm just going to go through a little bit about um, why that happens. So we all know we live in a quite a fragmented system these days. That's changed both the distribution and abundance of vegetation. And these two maps, the, the bottom map is quite old now. Um, I think that's around 2006, but it's still very relevant. So if you think of it as all those white patches are the highly modified and cleared regions that are obviously where the agriculture has primarily been in Australia. That's genetic diversity that no longer exists in Australia. There might be small pockets of representative diversity, but that's pretty much gone. So we're left with all those coloured patches to work with. Now, for plant populations, that means they're now much smaller than they were and they're much more isolated. And that changes the way plants work. It really does. Um, because they're stuck in a single spot, they germinate and that's where they stay. They're totally reliant on everything else happening around them, happening to them, basically. So they need animals, wind, or in some cases water, um, to disperse their pollen and their seed. That's how they get around the environment, is by something else. They can't do it themselves. So if we isolate them and make them smaller, that makes opportunities to do that much more difficult. I'm just going to go through two examples of why this happens, why we have a, an effect on quality and an effect on quantity. I'm going to use two examples that uh, Andrew Young has done research on uh, for many years now. Uh, the first one, so this is a button wrinklewort. Some of you will probably um, know this species. It's, um, primarily found in two patches now, around the ACT and down in Victoria. Um, some of those um, current orange dots are now, should be black extinct dots, unfortunately. It's um, in serious decline, even though it's protected, and um, ongoing decline in some populations, even though they're quite large. They're 200 plants, and in most people's minds, that's a big population, 
For this species, it's not. It's actually a critical threshold for them to actually start going into decline. So in these populations, we see low seed set, very poor recruitment, and as I said, ongoing decline. And the reason for this is because this species is what we call incompatible. It's self-incompatible. It can't mate with itself. So if you imagine this is a large population, and all the colours represent different genotypes. So the, um, the mechanism that's involved here is that if you're an orange plant, you can't mate with your, or yourself. Let's go back. You can't mate with yourself. That's why this mechanism is involved. It's to stop inbreeding. That's how it does it. You can't mate with yourself. But you can, of course, mate with all the other colours in the population because they're what we call compatible genotypes. You can't mate with other oranges, but you can mate with all these other different colours. That primarily produces lots of seed. So that means we've got lots of seed for restoration. You hear? Uh, we've also got lots of seed for the animals that either eat that seed or use it as part of their life cycle. So some insects must put their life cycle stage, their larval stage, through a, a seed. So that we need to leave seed in the environment for those. And it also means that seed can go into the seed bank for recruitment should the worst happen and the population becomes extinct. Now in a small population, what normally happens is when we do land clearing, we often leave groups of related plants. And that's simply because most seed, the majority of seed falls near the mother plant. Some of it gets dispersed out, but the further away you are, the less seed there are that gets dispersed. So the majority of seed falls close to the mother plant. So when you clear, primarily you're leaving a little family group. So you primarily you've got like mum and some of her offspring and then maybe some of their cousins. So you've got a nice highly related group and that sets up inbreeding in a really, really big way because now you're left with, in this case, all the orange genotypes and very few others. So your chances of producing seed become much, much less. It's a numbers game basically. So here we've got very little seed to be collected for restoration for the animals that need it and for natural recruitment. And remember, I said for this species, 200 plants was what we're starting to see as a small population. So there are some big challenges in how you choose your populations for your restoration. Now that's a self-incompatible plant. There are lots of species that are self-compatible and they have another issue when we come up with inbreeding. And this is another species, so a lot of the peas are self-compatible. It's got very similar attributes to the last uh, species. It's small, it's um, declining. We know here that we've got populations from around 10 to 400 doesn't matter what the population size for some of these is, you still get seed set. All of them still set seed, whereas in the other one, some of them started not setting seed. But we're still getting poor recruitment and the populations are still going into decline, the small populations. And that is simply because of inbreeding. So this is a graph that shows population size along here. And this is just, um, I've called it relatedness, but basically it's a scale of, if you're down here, you're more outbred. If you're up here, you're more inbred. And as you can see, there's a, the small populations are generally highly inbred. And as you get to the large populations, they become more outbred. And in any biological study, you always get one thing that won't perform. And this is the one here, but it doesn't change. Um, there are some issues around why that one's there, but it's primarily just ignore him and look at this. <laughs> ignore the outlier. <laughs> um, so why is that? Well, inbreeding can do... Uh, disastrous things in small populations of Swainstone erecta. So these are seed that are collected from large populations and then grown up under a glasshouse condition, so we know that the conditions are all similar. We get beautiful healthy plants, they're clearly what we want to use for restoration. When we take seed from here and grow it up, this is the result. Now some of you may have experienced this and not realised, you might have done everything right in your restoration and still didn't work. And one of the reasons why it didn't work might be the quality of the seed that you actually used, unknowingly um, used. And if you think this is just two examples where I might have just jagged two good results, no. Um, Andy Guerin, who works down in Victoria, he's a nurseryman, he actually started, after seeing this talk, he started looking at his seed collection and he's done his own little nursery experiments and he's actually demonstrating the same, same effect in Slender Bitter Pea. So these, um, these are plants he's grown. This is the number of parents that he collected from in the population. So we get really good growth when we get 100 or pretty good growth with 50 parents. But when we start going down to 10 or 2, you're seeing natural declines in the quality of the seedlings being produced. 
So that's a really quick and easy test that someone can do um, for themselves in a nursery, just to check the quality of seed. If you've done that test, then I think you actually could probably add a little bit of value to your seed on your seedlings because you can then say they've been tested in some sort of quality fashion. And here's another uh, um, example of inbred versus outbred seed in a, in a tree species. It's grown in the tropics because it's a tree, um, it's a species that's um, grown there for timber. But you can see quite markedly that if you have an outbreeding population, you get a much better result than if you get an inbreeding population. So clearly that's something to think about when you're collecting and using seed. So just a quick summary. Um, small outcrossing populations, you usually get reduction in seed, you will get low genetic diversity. Selfing populations, you often get poor quality seed. Um, but again, low genetic diversity. Now if we're gonna plant the best possible way we can, we wanna maximise the amount of genetic diversity. So small populations aren't ideal for big restoration projects or for any restoration project. They can be a part of it, but they can't be the sole source. Uh, can you tell which ones are self-compatible and self-incompatible? No. Um, Grevilleas, Banksias will range from slightly self-compatible to completely self-compatible. Acacias we think are probably self-incompatible somewhere on the range. We know that self to acacia seed often shows those really marked inbreeding effects and poor quality seed. Acacias tend to produce a lot of seed and they just get weeded out in the process, hopefully. Eucalypts have a mixed mating system. They'll self and they'll outcross. There's preference for outcross seed. Uh, and daisies, we try and say they're self incompatible, but there are some exceptions to that as well. So this is a wealth of information that we don't have about what species does what. You know, nearly a thousand eucalypts, 800 acacias, we'll never know. But we can try and get some rules around that with further research. And at that point, I'm going to do a little bit of um, shameless self-promotion. Um, uh, the AMPC, this, so the Australian Network for Plant Conservation and the Australian Seed Bank Partnership are actually, at the moment, looking at how we can actually produce seed standards, having been inspired by Sarah and the restoration guidelines, how we can come up with a similar model for helping people determine some seed standards. Right, climate change. So. Uh, something we've just published is what's going to happen to seed under changing climates. Um, and some of the predictions are we're going to have less seed to work with. So we know that high temperatures and less water will have really strong impacts on the amount of seed that can be produced. We already know in Australia that happens. You know, very hot climates, we don't, at times we don't get much seed. Uh, we already work in a boom and bust cycle. Those cycles are, are probably going to be lengthened. We'll have um, is it, more busts and less boom. So that makes it really important that we understand the ethical considerations around taking that seed if there's less seed being produced. It's really important that we start thinking in those long-term time frames. Probably already are shifting our planting times. Some of you probably may not even realise that you have shifted your planting times to accommodate changes in, in um, seasonal breaks. Uh, they may become more exaggerated and growing seasons uh, contract in some regions. Uh, that means there's an in increased risk of planting failure. So we're also going to probably have higher soil temperatures that could impact on germination growth and a risk, increased risk of severe events. Now that sounds pretty, should we all go home now? No, we won't, because we can work with this. You're all very clever people. So one of the ways we can cope with that in terms of seed is actually to set up seed production areas. And I'm not going to go into this a lot because Paul's going to give you a fabulous talk um, shortly about his experiences with seed production areas. But they are a mechanism that we can actually really start to use to make sure we can get those regular supplies of seed and we're not impacting on the native vegetation to produce all the seed we need. Uh, but there are some genetics involved, and this is a project that we did with Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority, um, just to assess um, a couple of their seed production areas. They re realised that they had a gap for Acacia Montana and two other species. Um, they put their seed production areas in, but they had no understanding of the genetic um, uh, diversity that they were dealing with at the time. As they've matured and they've started using them, they want to quality check them, so we've actually done this quick assessment. And these are two of their seed production areas one of the shapes represents a plant, and basically the plants are in genetic space, and so you can see a few, a few interesting things like this group here, because they're close together, they're probably high, highly related, and inbreeding, consequently. 
So these are all the adults that we've assessed and basically what it's telling us is that there's a bit of a mixture. So if you look at this one, the green dots are the seed production plants, so they're the things they've put in, all the rest of their wild populations. And you can see there's a bit of an overlap with a couple of different populations. So they've done pretty well trying to get representation of their wild populations into their seed production area. In the other one, the dookie one, however, pretty much all the plants overlap only with um, this remnant that we call W10. So really what they've done is replicate W10 in their seed production area. Um, and that's brought up a couple of um, really interesting things for them to understand in how they do that seed production process, how they've got to track what they put in to make sure it goes in, it survives. Because what's happened there is they've equally represented stuff into the seed production area. Some have sub subsequently died and it's been all those populations that are not represented that have probably died. So they can now go back and add to that seed production, improve its quality. Uh, the good thing for them was they were very proactive and they realised that because they didn't know what the genetic quality was, they shouldn't just use this seed and they've always been mixing it with seed from native vegetation. So they've always had that hedging their bet attitude towards maximising their genetic diversity. Uh, so, as I said, we're going to have to think about shifting our practices. Um, this is probably what a lot of you sort of work to at the moment over a kind of a two-year cycle, which is hard on a one year's funding. But you generally work your way through that process of, you know, prep, collection, preparation, sowing, and then, you know, if you've got any chance, you do a bit of monitoring and evaluation. Um, but we're suggesting that you're going to have to add a couple of new steps into here, and one is starting to evaluate the likelihood of success. And I think we're going to have to start doing some real pushback with um, funding agencies to say, I know, I know you all need the money because you all run on funding, but at some in some cases, I think there's going to be a shift from where well, you haven't actually delivered. So I think you need to be really careful and be on really strong ground. And that will be starting to evaluate whether you are likely to succeed that year, and if not, push back to the agency and say, we need a change. The other thing is, you're absolutely going to have to start evaluating success because we're going to be in a quite a dynamic system. And to be adaptive, we're going to have to build evaluation into that. And that's one thing that you have to keep pushing back to funding agencies as well. There's no point them funding if they can't work out what's going on with their funding. So that's my little rant. Okay. <laughs> so a couple of big guide, uh, considerations at the moment for seed sourcing is provenance. And you're probably wondering about provenance. So there's some issues with that. You might be using maladapted seed. You might be inducing inbreeding depression. You might create hybrids. We know that can occur. You might bring in a weed. Or you might bring in something that has a quite a different flowering time. The other thing is capturing that evolutionary potential. So you want this lots of genetic diversity to go in so that, you know, if a strong selection event happens, at least something will survive. And sure, that may become inbreeding, but at least you've still got something in the landscape to work with other than nothing. Um, do we have any evidence for that? Uh, well, we didn't, so we went precautionary and we said five kilometres. And that has no scientific basis at all, let me tell you. Um, everyone has their own interpretation of what the scale should be, but it's not a distance, okay? Provenance is not a distance. Provenance is a spot, a spot in the landscape. Um, but it's become this thing that it, it means the environment, it, it means a lot of other things. But you must consider life history, geographic distribution, Trevor's gonna talk about that shortly, and also genetics. Evidence, Nola Hancock, where is she? She's here somewhere, I know she is. Right, so Nola has done the most recent, some of the most recent work on local adaptation. Please go and talk to her about her findings, but pretty much not strong evidence. And if you do, do get evidence, it might be not in the way you think it's going to be. For example, the herbivory on Toretta Cornus. And then some other work that's been done uh, by Suzanne Prober and others has shown that it depends on the trait that you look at. So some traits are very plastic, some traits are very fixed. So overall, whether that means you've got local um, adaptation, it's very hard to tell at this stage. Uh, oh, this is um, Suzanne's work. So pretty much you can see on those graphs, things are different is the take home message from that. There's no single trend in any of those graphs. So some resources to help you, of course, there's the SERA guidelines, um, Appendix 3 and Box 2. They've been written to help you out try and make some of these decisions and to understand the importance of why we want to put genetics into your um, restoration programs.
Other things that might help are there's a couple of reports that we've written specifically for the Murray Basin region, but uh, some of the information there is very general. You'll find those on the Terra Nova website. NOLA has also led um, the writing of a primer that's almost ready to be published. It's a very handy hands-on guide how to do restoration. And that's it. Oh, and another shameless promotion. We're trying to build a Bringing Back the Banksias project, partnering up with uh, several agencies to have a look at local adaptation and improve restoration seed sources for silver banksia across its range.